this week on The Futurists. What we're not very good at is examining the ideology that governs the U.S. as well. And there's a lot of mythology here about the U.S. being number one in various categories where we clearly are no longer number one in those categories, but we still persist in the belief that we are. Science remains the best tool that we have for sorting out right theories from incorrect theories. However, our acceptance of science and political discourse in the United States has waned pretty substantially. This week on The Futurists, you get to meet the two futurists behind The Futurists. I'm Brett King, and joining me is Robert Turchek. Hi, hey, Brett. Robert. It's great to be here. How are you doing, man? Great. So um, this is our first episode of a brand new podcast. You and I have been doing podcasting for a decade now in various forms, and uh, we decided to come together and do our own thing, but with a specific purpose. Um, and, you know, the name says it all. We wanted to really bring attention to some of the leading thinkers, the futurists that are changing the world, that are envisaging a different world for us. And so um, welcome, Robert. Excited to do this with you. You know, over the last 10 years, you and I have been talking about, uh, from time to time, we talk about the super interesting people that we come across, that we yeah. encounter in our world travels, in our work, uh, in our projects. We're coming across people who not only have an idea about how the future might unfold, they actually are doing something to make it happen. Uh, so I think when I when I talk about a futurist or when I think about that word futurist, I'm not really thinking about someone who's gazing into a crystal ball. Uh, I don't actually believe you can make accurate predictions about the future. I don't think that's something that humans can do. But I do think that people can make accurate theories. And one of the exciting time, things about the time that we live in right now is that many of us has, have the opportunity to exercise some influence on how events unfold. So if you have a clear vision and you've got even a, the slightest opportunity to influence the outcome, it's a great time to be alive right Absolutely. now because you can shape the future. You can actually bring the future of your dreams or your visions. You can bring it into reality. And we know people who are doing that. And that's one of the exciting things about this podcast is that we're going to reach out to those people and ask them how they did it. I agree. And, you know, there's a lot of debate about, you know, what is a futurist or who are futurists and, you know, who owns that tag, you know, so we want to bring a bit of order to the chaos in respect to that. So if you know, if someone's coming on our show, you know that they've got a track record of forecasting, you know, they've got a track record of, you know, changing the world in a way that's meaningful from our perspective. I think that's, uh, that's it. Let me ask you this, Robert, um, mm -hmm. you know, you say you can't make predictions, but, what have you predicted in the past or what have you uh, forecasted in the past that you got right? Well, you know, some of the things that I've worked on, projects that I've worked on, uh, have involved launching services that simply didn't exist. You know, so before I got started with them, that type of medium or that type of entertainment or that type of content delivery did not exist. So my career has mostly been in the media field. And among the things I've launched are some of the very first games on computers, some of the very first multiplayer games on the web, uh, some of the earliest mobile games in the United States, uh, the very first video on mobile phones. And so in each of those cases, you might, you know, people might be listening saying, okay, that's a lot of techie stuff. That's a lot of media stuff. But let me assure you that every one of those projects before we launched it, some expert somewhere would come forth and tell us exactly why it wouldn't work, why it was impossible and it would never happen. And my take is, Never is a very long time, Brett. You know, yeah. when someone tells you it's never going to happen, I always think to myself, wow, yeah, that's a I long know. time to say yeah. something won't happen. Because if just one element changes, you know, if one, one negative factor switches and, and becomes true, then all of a sudden a whole avenue of possibility opens up. And so what I've noticed is that um, every time I get organized to launch a new service that doesn't exist, there's always someone telling me exactly why it's not going to work. And we tend to ignore that person and continue to just carry on with the project. And while they're telling us it won't work, we launched the thing. Today, the services I mentioned are now used by hundreds of millions of people every single day. And so it's a great joy to me to see that you, one person in their own lifetime can have the experience of launching something that never existed before. Now, of course, at this stage, that type of innovation has expanded outside of media and internet to touch just about every industry. And so if someone's listening and they've got imagination, they've got an idea and they, they have a vision for how things could be done differently, what we want you to know is that it's possible to make that reality. It truly is possible to bring it to fruition. So this is not a show that's about, you know, 
just pitching some forecast, some vision, some, some fuzzy notion about what might be in the future. I think what we're going to try to do in this show is always peg it back to real world events. Yeah. You know, whether that's actually doing it yourself, we'll certainly bring people on who are builders and designers and creators, or whether it's about influencing someone like an author who writes a, a really compelling vision of the future that inspires an entire generation to go out and build it. You know, for instance, you and I both remember the Neil Stevenson book, A Snow Crash, and you know the concept Amazing of the metaverse, book. Amazing like 1992, book. right? So, like back yeah. then, we were all like, "Yeah, cool, a virtual world, that'll be awesome." And now, quite literally, an entire generation of tech geeks is trying to build the metaverse. And so, you know, exactly. there's a great example of someone who, candidly, is very skeptical about this undertaking. Right? The author himself is like, "Well, I'm not sure this is actually such a great idea." But he planted the seed and the seed took hold in the minds of an entire generation of tech geeks. And now they're actually going to go out and try to build the metaverse. So that's the kind of inspiring idea. Maybe it's a cautionary tale. That's okay. Like, let's talk about those things. These are super interesting topics for our time. You know, um, Isaac Asimov is always one that comes to mind for me with the three laws of robotics, even though the three laws of robotics may not be the laws that we end up with around robotics. The fact that he was thinking about that in what was the 1940s when when he came up with that, Um, you know, and, and even the term robot was only like 25 years old at that time, you know, robotic from that Czech play Rossum's Universal Robots, you know, in, in 1921 or whatever. Um, You know, it's like, well, just imagine being able to take just this concept of a motorized human effectively and sort of play that out, you know, into, into sort of understanding autonomy and how that would impact. So, um, you know, I think, you know, we're going to talk about sci-fi authors in the second half of the show today, but um, you know, there, there, there are some people who've, who've, um, you know, like Neil Stevenson and others who've made some incredible, um, you know, or have laid out the landscape for us, even if you, you know, like yeah. the Star Trek thing with the communicator and all of that. Um, but um, these days, the the time between ideation of a new idea and the ability to execute is definitely shortening, right? And so I think that's true. And also remember, it's so competitive now. Um, if right. you have an idea, chances are quite good that 10 other groups of people have the same idea and they may be in 10 different parts of the world. And so you may have competitors you've never even heard of in a completely di- different corner of the world working on the same idea. And mainly I would say, if you suspect that might be true, then you should also assume that some of those teams are hungrier than you and more driven than you, and they sleep less hours every night than you and do. And they got better funding. They're, yeah, that's right. And they're, and they're striving towards it. Well, that's the other thing that's changed, Brett. This is a gigantic factor is the amount of funding that's available for new ideas, innovative ideas, even disruptive ideas the sheer amount of funding that's available is breathtaking. And the valuations, at least last year, you know, in 2021, were astounding for a startup company with no visible means of support. It's just an idea, just a vision, just a technology path. Um, But, you know, listen, we will certainly talk more about sci-fi and we will certainly talk about technology. But one of the things I really want people to understand is that when when it comes to forecasting uh, the future or putting together a model for the future, it's not just about technology because too often those two ideas are, are linked, you know, Oh, it's a futurist. And he's talking about technology. Technology is a gigantic factor. Let's not get that wrong. Of course it is, but there are actually four factors that govern the future. And if you're going to make intelligent predictions, reliable predictions or forecasts, I would prefer the word forecast over prediction. Right. Um, if you're going to try to do that, you really need to take into account all four factors. And those four factors are, First of all, resources, and that's, you know, the earth, the air, the water, the minerals. This is limited to what we've got on this planet. Yeah, maybe in the future we'll be mining asteroids or moving to Mars or something else. But at the moment, what we've got to work with is what's on this planet. So that's a finite resource. doesn't necessarily mean there's a scarcity. People often talk about, you know, resource shortages, but that's just a frame of mind. It's how we're utilizing the resource. And, you know, uh, in a moment, I'll talk about other factors that govern how that's done. The second big factor is demography population. Um, And this is factual, right? So we know about population and it doesn't change that quickly. So it's quite easy to predict or forecast what's going to happen with the population over the next 10 years. 
um, because it just involves birth rates and you know survival rates and but, so but, forth. But, but this is one that has changed pretty significantly over the last 15 years. And, right? and you'd be surprised how many people miss this, okay? Yeah. Because we make assumptions about the place where we live. You know, like I live in California, a lot of entrepreneurs in California, and they make the blunder of assuming the rest of the world is like California. And, and it's like, guys, you got to get out there and travel. You got to visit more places. You know, the one part of the world that's going to grow fastest in terms of population in the next 10 years is Sub-Saharan Africa. Exactly. And yet I work with tech companies every day that don't have an office in Sub-Saharan Africa, or they'll have an office in, you know, Joburg or, or Cape Town in South Africa, but they think that's covering all of Africa. What they're missing is that there's 52 countries. It's a whole continent. It's the second biggest continent. It's a patchwork of different kinds of governments, different kinds of people, different tribes, right. different Nigeria languages. Nigeria is going to be in the top five economies in the world in, in 20 It's clearly on the path, right? There'll be another billion people in Africa by the end of, by, by 2030, by the end of this decade. And so to, to anyone who's listening, if your plans for the future don't include Africa as a central focus, you're probably going to miss an opportunity. Flip it around. If you get it right and you're offering an app or a service or a new product or some other kind of innovation that works, well, you might just pick up another 100 million users. It's like getting in an elevator and riding to the top floor, just the sheer force of demographic trends. And by the way, by the same, same token, Every country in the Northern Hemisphere is essentially flat in terms of population growth. Yeah, Russia's and, in decline, Europe's the, in decline. Peak China happened about five years ago. Yeah. Their population isn't isn't growing as fast as it was. The U.S. The population US only end, grows because of, of immigration. Decade. Yeah, and and that's the that's a really key point is that yeah. um, you know we've seen a pushback against immigration the last few years you know in yeah. Europe because of the uh, Syrian civil war um, you know and and generally from in terms of the populist movement but the reality is as these as the birth rates continue to shrink in um, developed economies they're going to have to really bring in talent they yeah. have to bring in immigration to keep the economies growing you that's know right. um, uh, you know the, like, econ the economies of social democracies yeah. require population and population and immigration Absolutely. in order to survive. The only reason the United States population is not in decline is because of immigration. It's the one factor that keeps it growing a little bit, but barely. Uh, so, so demographics is an important factor. And again, it seems quite obvious until you start to peel back the few layers of the onion and then you discover that it's a, a complicating factor. The third big factor is technology, and we all know about technology. It moves so quickly. Often it's accelerating. Uh, the accelerating technologies have a profound influence over future trajectories, so it's important to take that into account. Uh, but it's really when you start to combine these factors together that you get to the most interesting scenario planning opportunities. And that brings me to the fourth factor, which is governance. And governance comes in two ways, markets and government regulation, right? Those are the two things. If essentially, you know, the, the ideal scenario is that you've got a free-ish market. I don't think there's ever really been a real free market ever, uh, but there's a free-ish market, free enough to enable innovation and enable entrepreneurs to do novel combinations of resources and demo, demo, demographics and, and technologies in order to create something new. And then the role of the government is to be kind of an umpire, uh, to kind of right. like make sure that the game is played fairly, to make sure that there are no, um, there's no fraud and so forth. You know, so for instance, an example I use there is um, given all the activity with NFTs, uh, non-fungible tokens in the past two years, we've seen tremendous growth there, but there is effectively no regulation that's governing it. And no surprise, there's a ton of fraud. You know, so by some estimates, 80% exactly. of the tokens for sale on OpenSea right now are fraudulent. Uh, they're either ripped off or copyright infringement, or there's some other measure of fraud attached to them. So you need both in the governance field. You need the free market. You need that, um, that, that way to channel entrepreneurial energy towards economic return and reward. But you also need some kind of umpire there to make sure that it's a fair game. So it's those four factors together that help shape the future. And if you study those four factors, then you can start to formulate, uh, I think, a credible hypothesis, which I would call a, a forecast. The next step is then to turn it into a story. And this right. brings us to science fiction uh, because, you know, scenario planners tell stories, but candidly, they're quite boring, the stories that they tell. And the scenario planning stories are fact-based. You know, they're very serious. You see these kind of things from places like the World Economic Forum. They're hard to read, candidly, because they're quite dull. They might be very accurate forecasts, the people who make the interesting forecasts are science fiction authors. So after the break, let's talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Now on the uh, governance side, um, you know, there's some interesting 
evidence emerging of different regulatory environments. You know, you have had obviously some big changes in terms of governance. You know, you've got the European uh, Union, which has created sort of centralized governance there. There's some debate over whether that's been effective, but it has created standards that are, um, you know, uh, broadly uh, accepted. But one more recent example of, um, you know, sort of a softer touch on a regulatory side is what China's done with the tech side. Um, and you've seen incredible growth there in technologies like the mobile wallets um, there. And now they're launching the central bank digital currency at the yeah. Olympics, the first nation to, to launch an over 35 million mobile wallets already uh, downloaded there. Um, so, uh, but if you, if you look at the environment compared with say the U S or the UK around FinTech, you know, an area that I've um, studied significantly, one of the reasons China is now so far ahead of the United States in respect to sort of core FinTech growth is that lighter touch of regulation. And so- um, now, It's interesting you say it's yeah. a lighter touch because what I've heard is that in the past year, President oh, it's Xi changed has in the taken last a year, very heavy sure. hand approach. Oh, so tell me about that. Well, you know, I mean, the, because it was so successful, and so disruptive, um, you know, to give you an idea, um, you know, in 2020, um, in terms of plastic cards used around the world, credit cards, debit cards, you know, um, gift cards, et cetera, we totaled about $35 trillion of payments globally for all of the plastic cards in the world. Huh. But in 2020, the two mobile wallets in China, Alipay and Tencent WeChat Pay, did $52 trillion of mobile payments. Wow. So that's three times China's GDP, and it's almost twice what the rest of the world did with plastic card payments. Um, and Jack Ma's uh, business, Alipay, or actually called Ant Group, is the parent company of, of the mobile wallet, and they have a they have a bunch of uh, different businesses underneath that. Ant um, was set to IPO in China in um, October of twenty. 20, I think, if I'm if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. October or November 2020, they were set, set to IPO. The breaks were put on that after Jack Ma made negative comments about how slow the banking industry was and how far ahead Ant was, right? And that was deemed to be unpatriotic, that he was criticising the existing system. He was to some extent right um, about that, but at the same time, Alipay had been so dis Alipay and Tencent WeChat Pay had been so disruptive to the traditional model of banking. You know, think about just the fact that um, you know pre these mobile wallets, ninety eight percent of retail transactions in China were done with cash. Right, credit cards weren't big there. Debit cards weren't big, um, and now you've got um, you know in in twenty twenty two it's going to be around thirty percent cash, and so you know that. That demonetization, uh, you know, or the removal of cash out of the system as a result of mobile wallets, we've we've not seen that happen anywhere near as rapidly, um, you know, in anywhere, anywhere else in the world. So that's just okay. One so, indicator. so what I'm hearing you say is that uh, a, a governance model that allows for innovation can, over a period of say ten years, lead to some transformative results. And and I think it's true uh, for particularly for listeners in the U.S. or in Europe who don't travel to China. We don't get to see firsthand just how mobile first the Chinese economy has. Yeah, and, in, and in many exactly. respects, they've leapfrogged ahead of the United States. And, you know, here in California, where I'm based, we tend to think of ourselves as a, always as being at the leading edge of innovation and technology innovation. Um, but but that's not actually true anymore. Innovation happens everywhere. Yeah. And um, in many respects, uh, our tech giants here in the U.S., have stifled innovation. Uh, so we get innovation we, we'll, at their pace. Yeah. And we'll as a result, have to we get don't see some... the flurry of new things that are happening in other parts of the world. I, I hope that's one of the I things agree. we can bring into no, the show. No, absolutely. In fact, I'd love to get Kai Fu Lee on. Let's uh, target yeah, him. Because right. um, you know, if, if you've read his book on AI yeah. superpowers, you'll understand how competitive China is and how yeah, that competition has exactly. uh, sort of uh, borne out some, some incredible results there. I mean... Um, yeah, I, you know, obviously China has to do some work on on PR uh, in the rest of the world, but the U.S.'s view of China is is also not a realistic 
view there to some extent but uh, yeah, i'd love to true. have a more global view of this and and you know having lived uh, you know obviously i'm australian yeah. um, i live in new york right now but i'm in the process of moving to thailand and i've lived in hong kong and i lived in dubai so i hope to be able to bit bring a bit of that sort of global network to this play as well robert yeah, I agree. I think that makes good sense. And and like yourself, I've lived and worked all over the world. So I hope that we can do that, bring a global perspective. Uh, you know, speaking of regulation and governance, we should talk about the United States because there was a strategic decision made in the 1990s not to regulate the internet. And the notion that at that time was, let's not preemptively regulate this industry. Let's let it grow and see what happens. Well, that was a very smart idea. I think it was very wise. It's also one of the few examples of government restraint that I've seen in my entire career yeah. where they basically let this flower or the garden blossom, but now the garden's out of control. And now there's a big question of whether U S regulators have the power to regulate these tech giants, these companies that now exceed a trillion dollars, in some cases, 2 trillion in valuation. Uh, maybe they're too big to regulate. So maybe we'll come back and take a look at that regulatory lens as one aspect of governance, as one of the main factors that that shapes the future. Because it's certainly true if the new antitrust cases prevail, it's a really big if, but if the new antitrust cases prevail against companies like Facebook and Google and so on, um, then we might see some kind of breakup or some sort of change in governance. And that would dramatically shape the future in a different mm. way. So it's important to bear that in mind. But at the moment, at present, it doesn't look like uh, government has many tools at its disposal to shape the trajectory of those companies. I think one of the other things that we should definitely look at as well is, you know, as we're looking for forecasting and we're looking at the building blocks of 21st mm-hmm. century economies, we should be looking at the um you know, the preparedness of the economy in terms of pure skills, STEM skills, science, technology, engineering, math, and the education behind that. Because it's, I think it's no secret, but the, you know, the education in this respect is slipping in the US uh, right now in terms of education standards. Um, and one of the really interesting um, elements of, uh, of China's emergence as the world's number one economy, you know, over the next few years um, for the for the world is that they've invested very heavily in sort of retooling their population for these technology skills, artificial intelligence, uh, you know, for every uh, one PhD uh, um, STEM graduate in the US, China produces three at the moment. So, um, you know, I think that would be interesting to get into too, is, you know, how do we prepare our um, populace? How do we prepare our systems that we have for the changes that are inevitably coming in the future? It's an interesting point. It touches a related notion that I think is quite important. Uh, It's about a science-based outlook on the future and a mythological-based outlook on the future or an ideological view of the future. And while uh, here in the United States, we're very quick to accuse other countries of being driven by authoritarianism and ideology, what we're not very good at is examining the ideology that governs the U.S. as well. And there's a lot of mythology here about the U.S. being number one in various categories where we clearly are no longer number one in those categories, but we still persist in the in the belief that we are. Um, and some belief about, uh, or some, I guess, misguided understanding of what education should consist of and whether we should be indoctrinating people or or teaching people. Uh, you know, science remains the best tool that we have for sorting out right theories from incorrect theories. And uh, that hasn't changed. Well, that's unlikely to change. However, our acceptance of science in political discourse in the United States has waned pretty substantially to the point where experts, uh, scientific experts on a subject are often dismissed and sometimes rudely so. Uh, This is problematic because it clouds people's ability to think athletically about what's coming next and prepare themselves for it. And then what happens is you end up with an angry, disappointed mob who feels like they were hoodwinked. Uh, That's very destabilizing, particularly for democracy. So I, sure, I mean, I think we'll we've seen evidence. That. I think we've seen clear evidence of that with the pandemic. Um, you know, the the if if you look at the science around mRNA and what it's enabling and gene therapy in general, um, yeah. you know, we're talking about an mRNA vaccine in trial now for um, HIV AIDS. Um, we are talking about gene therapy that potentially could eliminate diseases from the genome. So yeah. these advances are going to be. S- s- 
tremendously powerful over the next 20 to 30 years. And, you know, when we look at mRNA and, you know, whether you um, are vaccinated or not, um, you know, uh, the fact that it's sort of come of age after 30 years of investment in this technology and and now we're we're using that, I think sometimes that's lost, that all of that hard work that's been put into making sure the, these uh, these technologies work. And, you know, after all, mRNA in, in particular just, just mimics the, the our own immune system in, yeah. in many respects. But, but, but with a very significant really difference, right? So, so the, the, the key takeaway on mRNA is that it's the, it's the brainchild of synthetic biology. And the principle of synthetic biology is that we can start to program biology the same way we program a computer. This is a bold concept and it's not yeah. new. It's been around for more than a dozen years, but these vaccines are one of the very first tangible results of it, certainly on a planetary scale, they're the first encounter with synthetic biology products that most humans have had. Okay, so that's an amazing story about a breakthrough in science. But if you look at the political discourse around the pandemic in the United States, what you're hearing is a narrative that doesn't even touch on any of that amazing stuff. Instead, you hear mythology like, oh, they're implanting a chip inside of us. And, And this is just so absurdly incorrect. First of all, what kind of chip? Are you talking about- How's it uh, going to be powered? Some kind of wireless yeah. chip? Yeah. Like, is there a wireless part? Show me where the radio part is. There it's robots so what? Does it have yeah. software? Is there a microprocessor in this chip? What's the energy source for that chip? So what we're hearing is mythology from people who have absolutely no idea how the technologies they're referring to work. It's ignorance piled on top of mythology, piled on top of disinformation campaigns. This actually clouds our ability to make intelligent forecasts and to make smart decisions about how to prepare for the future. Right. And what people should know is from outside the United States, people in other countries are looking at us and saying, what a shame. It was the most technologically advanced society and now it's a society awash in fake mythology, not even like genuine mythology that arises from you know, so the, the population or tribal conviction or some historical lore. It's mythology that's been generated uh, by paid hacks and pushed out at, uh, through social media. Well, these things too are trends that we're gonna have to cover because part yeah. of our message, part of our mission in the show The Futurist is to cut through all the noise and find the signal. And Brett, I would suggest that today there's a lot more noise in every channel than there ever has been historically. People are publishing more and more content and the ratio of bad stuff to good remains 90 to 10. Our job is to find that 10%, find the people who are talking about that 10% and applying yeah. it to something. So if you're, if you're listening to this podcast, then I want to give you the, a commitment from Robert and I. Um, and um, that is that, you know, we are going to curate um, the most credible people on the planet at getting the future right, you know, in terms of understanding the sort of changes we, we're going to have to make helping us understand how to forecast better um, and understanding, you know, what impact that's going to have on the daily lives of individuals like ourselves. And that's, um, you know, what we make the commitment to do. But uh, right we're just going to take a quick break and we'll be back right after this break to talk about how science fiction has influenced uh, futurism. Welcome to Breaking Banks, the number one global fintech radio show and podcast. I'm Brett King. And I'm Jason Henricks. Every week since 2013, we explore the personalities, startups, innovators, and industry players driving disruption in financial services. From incumbents to unicorns, and from cutting edge technology to the people using it to help create a more innovative, inclusive, and healthy financial future. I'm JP Nichols, and this is Breaking Banks. Well, welcome back to The Futurist. This is the show where we take a look at all the trends that are going to shape our future and talk to the folks who are thinking the hardest about that, developing the scenarios around the future, and in many cases, inventing the future. I'm Rob Tursik, and I'm joined here by Brett King, and the two of us together are going to interview folks who are helping us understand the future and prepare for it. So welcome back to the futurists. And, you know, Brett, one of the things we both share in common is an abiding love for science fiction. I admit it. I'm an unabashed fan Mm -hmm. of science fiction. I've been reading it my entire life. I think it's fun. I think it's inspiring. 
I love the visions that are spelled out. And now, weirdly, at this stage in life, I'm actually able to see some of those scenarios are are actually coming to play out, right? Absolutely. You know, famously, um, you know, famously, like we talked about in the beginning of the show, the uh, the, the prediction of the metaverse, you know, for better or for worse, I think that was really a warning. Mostly, Neil Stevenson was warning us about this totally virtual world and some of the pitfalls there of an AI-driven corporation and so on. And weirdly, now uh, some folks have embraced that as kind of a manifesto, and now they're seeking to go out and build it. Um, that's not the only example, and there'll be many others. Uh, Brett, tell us about some of the sci-fi authors that you've got lined up. Well, we've got Kevin J. Anderson on our show next week talking about the Dune universe. So we're going to be talking to David Brin about uh, um, the evolution of humanity and, um, you know, in terms of sociological and ethnographic growth, he writes about societies 10,000 years in the future. I want to have Kim Stanley Robinson on. Stan is, um, you know, probably the top sci-fi author in the climate Um, space right now. He just wrote The Ministry of the Future. If you haven't read it, I strongly recommend it. Um, And, uh, you know, we're going to have Ramez Nam from Singularity. Uh, He's going to be talking about energy. Who's a cool person, right? He's a great illustration of the kind of person who who does write science fiction. It's very compelling, but he also writes non He's a practitioner as well. Extraordinarily good. And then, yeah, he puts his ideas into action, particularly in the energy field where he has deep expertise. So good, good illustration of the kind of person we're thinking of when we use the term futurist. Yeah. And I, I think that's, um, you know, I, like science fiction is a great landscape for um, helping us envision the future. And, you know, you, you when you look at things like the Star Trek communicator and, you know, its influence on the Motorola flip phone design and things like that, you know, those connections have been made before, but um, it, it's like, well, you know, Think about Jules Verne, fax machines, heli- you know, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, helicopters, uh, you know, uh, Jules Verne, fax machines, submarines, you know, et cetera. Um, you know, they, they were logical schools of thought. Of course, um, some of the predictions or, or forecasts that were made in, in the past by science fiction authors also, you know, ended up being um, way off, off base. Um, you know, like, uh, you know, um, it went before email existed. If you, you, you talked about the future of communication, um, you know, you would have had uh, uh, maybe concepts of um, electronic fax machines and things like that mm. and how they would extend. Drones is one of those areas that not a lot of people, not a lot of science fiction authors got right, you know. Um, but robots is one where they did get it right. You right, know? exactly. Um, yeah, some, some of the things are physically impossible. So like a matter transporter, for instance, uh, where there's no there's no physics today to support that concept. Um, some of the energy drives that are proposed for starships also. Uh, but like I said earlier in the previous part, never say never. Exactly. Because for exactly. every madcap idea that people have dismissed as outlandish and impossible, there's somebody somewhere who's working on it right now. The example I'd use is flying cars. And for a million good reasons, flying cars are highly unlikely. But notice I'm not saying they're not going to happen because there mm. are plenty of people who are committed to bringing flying cars. And as it turns out, um, vertical takeoff uh, uh, aircraft, like small, short distance vertical takeoff aircraft, had kind of a boom last year because yeah. most of the major airlines are now making investments. Uh, they're viewing that as kind of like the last hop from the airport to the final destination, at least for first class passengers uh, who don't want to get stuck in traffic. And of course, if you've been to a city like Sao Paulo in Brazil, where you know anyone who can afford it is jumping on a helicopter to go to the airport because exactly. they don't want to deal with grinding through traffic, you can actually imagine a use case for it. Now, is it feasible, affordable? You know, for a million reasons. It's still unlikely. However, the balance got shifted a little bit towards more plausible last year because now the big airlines see that this could actually greatly enhance their service. And so I think here what we can do is um, get inspiration from the sci-fi authors. We certainly want to understand their methodology for forecasting to the extent that they have a methodology. Um, But also, let's talk about the hits and misses. It's okay to talk about it. You know, like I think um, if you're going to make forecasts, you have to embrace the notion that some of the scenarios that you talk about are not going to happen. I feel like if you're even 50% right in this field, you're doing fantastically well because so many factors are at play. You know, when I spoke about those four, four forces, what's important to understand is the four forces interact with each other. And that makes for very unpredictable situations. You know, so it's not just the resources and the people and the markets and the government regulations and so on. 
it's that those things have an interplay and it's hard to predict how populations uh, are going to affect government decisions, you know, for instance, or, uh, you know, so, so a mass outcry against gigantic technology monopolies might override the free market instinct that allows those monopolies to exist in the first place. That might play out. We're going to see that battle happen. So what happens with science fiction is that they make an entertaining narrative. Uh, they convey a world. They describe a world in words in such a compelling way that we can imaginatively project ourselves into it. And when we do, as soon as we do that, you can start to envision possibilities. Exactly. And some of the people who do it are going to start to conjure up, like they'll work their way back and say, hey, that's a cool scenario to get there. What's an intermediary what must step? Be true? Yeah. yeah, what are all the things that what need to What are the types true? of technologies that need to advance to make this possible? Um, that's you know, it. Who's working on them? You know, is there material science we need to change to be able to make this possible, you know, et cetera? Yeah. So, so when you look at someone like Elon Musk is the you know, best case example, I think of this right now, it's his mission is to get people on Mars. Now we can differ about whether that's Clearly. a good mission, a viable mission, a necessary mission and so forth, but that's what well, he's doing. Well, you know, you, you're going to hear through the life of this podcast, I'm a fan of, of the Mars mission. Um, I think it, I think, you know, one of, one of the things I agree with on Elon, with the Elon on this is, is, and we'd love to have him on the show at a later date as well, but um, it is sure. the issues of humanity in terms of the big picture stuff, you know, yeah, we've got problems we have to solve and things like that, but humanity needs a reason. You know, we, we need to, we, we need things driving us forward to thrive, to push us, to expand our horizons, to expand our intellect. And you need those big goals. Look at the Apollo project or the human That's genome right. project, you know, and the, yeah. these, these types of projects that bring people together, um, you know, on these massive uh, moonshots and leaps in terms of technology. And in, in both cases, the reigning experts at the time said that they would never happen. If you look at the yeah. beginning of the Human Genome Project, there was tons of skepticism at the time. And the same, of course, is famously true for the Apollo mission, where experts were like, that's not going to work. It'll never happen. So it's not just inspiration. It's a rallying cry. And that rallying cry can bring together the political will, the scientific vision, the grunt work, you know, the, the sheer hard effort to make it possible, and the economic support, the resources can be made, made available to fund it. That's a really big deal. So, so for those who are listening to the show who are not themselves going to be starting a company or they're not technologists, but still are inspired by the future, visions of the future, you can make a great big difference just by telling a compelling narrative. That narrative becomes a rallying cry or a banner around which a group of people can organize and they share that vision because you've told such a compelling tale. You've kind of enchanted them. They all believe it. And the difference, or I guess the, the gap between belief and action is getting very, very narrow. Yeah, and it'd be interesting to actually look at some of those things that have happened in the past in terms of science fiction authors and things like that, where they have got it right is, you know, what is the process that they went through to do that, you know, like mm -hmm. to make those those guests, uh, um, guesses? Right, like H.G. Wells, yeah. you know, like yeah. how did he arrive at his, his visions of the future? It'd be quite interesting. Yeah. You know, yeah. certainly one author we should consider is Arthur C. Clarke because he famously predicted the, the advent of telecommunications satellites. Right. Spelled In out fact, exactly um, how they would work. Geosynchronous orbit up, satellites are called Clark orbit. They're that's orbit. right. Yeah. He was 100% right. Uh, so there are many, many examples of that. And um, I find it inspiring and fun. And hopefully that'll add another element of storytelling to this program. You, you mentioned so Neil Stevenson. Um, you know, we, William Gibson's another one, which is, he's interesting. You know, I love his quote as the future's already here. It's just not evenly distributed yet, which is, you know, another great thing to look at when you're looking at, at, at futurists in general is that, um, you know, they're working to close the gap between, right. um, you know, what, what's possible and, and what's available. Um, but um, apart from Neil Stevenson, what other science fiction authors have influenced you in terms of really have sort of captured your imagination? Well, as a, as a boy growing up in the Midwest, I was inspired by Ray Bradbury because his stories are perfectly calibrated for a 10-year-old boy in, in Ohio or Illinois. And so uh, that, that was an author I was very inspired by. I also loved Robert Heinlein. Uh, enjoyed his yeah. books very much. Uh, I think Stranger in a Strange Land is it was profofoundly impactful on me at, at the time. Um, I liked Andre Norton. I mean, the list goes on and on and on, but I, I'm also um, I'm very fond of pulp fiction authors in general. and uh, you know, authors like Philip K. Dick 
have, right. you know, influenced so many people in Los Angeles, in the entertainment industry with a compelling vision of, you know, kind of a dystopian future or dysfunctional, very near future. And so many of his stories have been turned into films. And then again, those films end up having a profound impact on the way people yeah. perceive the world, what they're moving towards. So all of those authors, and I think we should probably include science fiction films uh, as another aspect, because, you know, think of Star Wars today. Look, Star Wars is just an application of that classic hero's journey uh, thing that was developed, the theory that was developed uh, by Joe Campbell, um, but a very compelling application of it and a very convincing application, you know, very fanciful and, and vivid imagination of what the future might look like. Today, we mostly use Star Wars as a kind of metaphor the way perhaps a, a previous generation would use like a religious metaphor or something, you know, they would use some uh, yeah. archetype from their own mythology uh, in a way, star Wars is modern mythology. And so it's a reference point. So when we talk about, you know, big tech companies facing off against feisty decentralized startup companies, you'll invoke the metaphor of the empire, you know, and the death star right. against the rebel Alliance, because everybody knows what you're talking about. So it's a kind of a conceptual shorthand that makes it quite easy to convey a concept and frame an idea there is real utility to that. I mean, this is not just yeah. fun and games. This is actually I, I, efficient for people. I actually, um, I heard a really good opinion piece or read a good opinion piece on why so much sci-fi has been dystopian <laughs> yeah. uh, in the past from a movie and TV series perspective. You might have heard this as well, is that um, a lot of it comes down to the production cost is that building a utopian universe is a lot more expensive yeah. from a sci-fi uh, movie production than it is uh, building a dystopian it's, it's one. It's pretty easy it's to easy get set to find designers old to just, buildings that are yeah, falling down. Yeah, exactly. And, and you break and the windows rubble. or have spray yeah, paint exactly. or something. Yeah, yeah. So you can, you can degrade the existing world easily. Also, we see that happening in our day-to-day -day lives, right? So entropy is a factor in every city in the world. So we experience it. It seems very credible to us that these places are going to kind of disintegrate and go away or or fall apart over time. What's very, very difficult is to design a new world from scratch that is holistic in the sense that it right. has an economic logic to it and it has a rationale to it and it has a, you know, a political concept and so forth. So on that note, uh, what we might want to do for the show is bring in world builders. And I'm fortunate to know several of those folks as well. Uh, world builders like the team that designed um, Minority Report, that Spielberg film right. starring Tom Cruise, that again, it's had such a profound impact on how we think about the future. Uh, they actually had an economic team, an advertising team, a commerce team, a social team to design scenarios for that world of the future. And they had to govern it so that all those scenarios plugged in together into sort of a coherent whole. And so if you haven't looked at uh, Minority Report in a while, I, I'd recommend you go back and take a look at it. The film's like 20 years yeah. old, but it holds well, even up just really, the, really well. The, 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 they use iris recognition for mm -hmm. commerce and transport. And, and personalized identity. advertising right. and so on, right? Right. Um, and and it's not like that stuff is really in front of you too much. It's kind of just woven right. into the narrative and occasionally yeah. moves the plot point ahead, you know. Um, and now we have facial recognition in places like China, which, um, you know, it, it, it obviously is significantly ahead. There are about 600 federal databases in the US, of course, with facial recognition technology being used now. But, um, you know, th this is a logical transition in respect to what we think of um, around digital identity for the 21st century. Um, you know, yeah. and so, um, you know, we are starting to grapple with that. We're finding that you know, physical identity, your your passport or your driver's license, that those uh, credentials can be sort of easily stolen in the current world. And we're looking for better better analogies. So, you know, if you, you start, it's probably not going to be iris recognition, but it probably will be device-based and facial recognition. And yeah, other there'll be some sort of biometric and, thing. You know, usually they say the best security is something you know and something you have. So right. your body, your biometrics is something and you have. Something and then there's you just do, the code like the you heuristics, need to know. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I think you're right about that. And certainly the future of identity is a gigantic topic. And that's one that we will certainly cover on this show. Uh, in fact, I had a very interesting conversation just a, two days ago that I wanted to share with you because this is a person I'd very much like to bring on the show. Um, we were talking about identity that you can transfer from one metaverse to another, right? So the principle here is that you know, as much as there's a lot of hoopla right now about Meta or Facebook's version of the metaverse, we know very well that there'll be hundreds of other companies launching their own versions, and many of them will be platforms that allow people to create yet another version. So you can imagine yeah. millions of metaverses 
are quite is a quite likely scenario over the course of the next decade. And the big question is then, well, what kind of credentials do I bring from one metaverse to another? How do I teleport from one of those worlds to another right. world? Do I have to go through the process of setting up my avatar, registering accounts, or is there going to be some sort of you know universal transferable credential? Um, now, my instinct was sure because people are going to want that and that'll be efficient and it'll be better and faster and easier. So it seems quite obvious that we're going to need some sort of transferable digital identity credential. Well, as it turns out, um, people who are working on it are like, no, actually nobody wants that. So we'll bookmark that idea for a future time, but this is a great And the point. whole, we, we should definitely get into decentralized versus centralized. Oh, you know, you're coming. talking about governance, yes. but we, you yes. know, in terms of the metaverse, it's definitely- Brett, we got to bring the weed whacker out for that yeah, subject exactly. about decentralized yeah. versus centralized because there's so much noise there in that, yeah. uh, in that space. But I, but I think this idea is uh, illustration of a point that you can have a decent hypothesis. You can have a good- theory about what's going to happen. And then when you actually talk to the people who are working on that particular area, it turns out that theory doesn't hold water. Um, and I'm okay with being wrong because if I'm wrong, it means I'm getting smarter. Somebody else is going to correct me. Uh, so we'd certainly welcome that. I think we well, welcome that, that's hearing a, from that's the people. That's a great objective, isn't it? It yeah. is, is um, you know, if you want to get smarter, then listen to the futurists because we're going to have people that are going to make <laughs> you smarter. Um, I know promise. All of us could do that with that, but um, I do think know, for people who are listening, if there's a if there's a sci-fi author that you're keen on, or if there is a particular subject matter that you want to learn more about, or if there's a question that, that you've yeah. got about the future, or even about the methodology, you know how how might I become a better forecaster? Certainly send those to us because we want to hear from you. We want to design the show for you. Those are the kinds of questions that we're curious about, so you can count on us to go find the answers. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, on that uh, message or on that uh, theme, you know, one of the things we want to try and do is bring some structure to this conversation. And so on the Futurist website, you're going to see not only uh, interviews from the Futurists that we are profiling, but also their subject matter areas. Uh, uh, so, you know, whether that is uh, climate, um, you know, engineering or specific technologies like artificial intelligence, gene therapy, longevity science, you know, whatever that field is, we want to sort of create a library of content around those specific domains as well. So if there's a domain you're interested in, um, specifically in terms of technology that's developing that area, also please let us know, because that's uh, one of the ways we want to think about this. Um, you know, it, I, ideally, uh, you know, if we take sort of the top 10 or 15 or 16 sort of categories of, of things that we, we want to look at in the, in the future, you know, we can have a view of sort of the short term future, a medium term and long term. So that's something else we sort of also want to look at when it gets into the futurist. You're going to hear at the end of each episode when we're speaking to the futurist. All right. Give us your 10 year, 20 year estimate, your 50 year estimate and your 100 year estimate in terms of what's going to ha happen here. Now, as Robert rightly said, this is not necessarily going to be the art of, of prediction, but we do hope that we can forecast some of these macro changes. And if we get enough of these futurists together, build some really interesting um, sort of visions of what that future is going to be like. I think that's right. And I think the exercise of formulating a hypothesis, even if it's incorrect, is a good skill to build. It's a, it's, it's good athletic thinking. Um, how do, how know, can futurists help business people, I guess, you know, like that's going to be, if you're an entrepreneur, how can a futurist or someone in that field help you expand on your business idea? You know, what steps can they, you know, uh, can they give you a competitive advantage? All of those. Well, you know, it's a very lively part of my business as a consultant. This is a big piece of what, um, what I do for companies. They ask me to come in and help them plan for the next 10 years. And, and let me point out that 10 years is a long time. 10 years yeah. is hard. Uh, it's not too difficult to develop a, a theory about what will happen over the next three years. Uh, we can see pretty clearly a couple of years out, the third year gets a little bit harder. Five years is tough. 10 years is almost impossible. Uh, so, so you end up with, um, think of it as a cone of possibility, an ever expanding cone of possibility and a series of if then statements. So if these trends hold true, then this might be possible complexity comes in when you start to intersect the trends together. So if this trend intersects with another trend, you know, so for instance, you know, the, 
the cost of processing power is dropping, the amount of storage that we have available or the bandwidth in the network increases, uh, the cost or the availability of this in different parts of the world to different populations becomes available. You have to start to take all those things into account and the list goes on and on and on. You start to see that this cone of possibility can expand in a lot of directions. Uh, then what we do for scenario planning is um, we start to develop narratives around some of those. We say, okay, so if these five things are true or these 10 elements are true, what does it look like? Uh, tell me about a day in the life. Tell me about how this would play out. Tell me how would someone find this product in that scenario? Brett, the world is changing so fast right now in so many ways, on so many fronts, in the in the form of the fact that you know now 5 billion on this people on this planet are connected and have a, a supercomputer in their hands that gives them superpowers and an instant access to all the world's information. That means they can make decisions in ways that they never could have even 15 years ago, right? So that's a gigantic shift. Any company that's trying to market or deliver services to those people has to understand that. It has to be in front of those people in the places exactly. where they are. That's just one element of the change, right? Then you add into that the rapid technological progress that's happening, all the challenges around the world's resources and climate and so forth. And you can start to see that that roadmap gets awfully murky, it, awfully even fast. Just, even just the impact of AI on employment and society. I know we're going to talk about uh, that uh, in, in greater detail as well, but that's all right. of that makes, uh, uh, you know, that that's all going to, you know, could take us off in very different directions. For right? sure. Um, so. For sure. And when we bring up AI and climate, it's always back to this dystopian view. Uh, we very much frequently hear the dystopian side, you know, robots are going to steal your jobs, robots are going to take over and so forth. Um, I want to state for the record that I'm um, I'm an optimist. I am a cautious optimist. I'm a, maybe a, 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 a careful or pessimistic optimist in the sense that I want to kick the tires pretty hard. But I do believe in progress and I do have faith, uh, conviction uh, that people will figure out the right thing to do to make the right next move. We might go through a lot of bad decisions before we get to the right one, but eventually we're going to arrive at an what, optimal outcome. What is the future of humanity is is at the heart of all of this. And, yeah. uh, you know, Aristotle, I think, said it best, which is the the future or the purpose of humanity, rather, is to thrive. And the only way we can really thrive is continue to make progress. So that's, right. that's sort of at the heart of what this conversation is about. How, as a human species, can we make demonstrable progress that's going to benefit everybody, that's going to improve the life of our grandchildren, um, our societies that we live in, that is going to make us as a species that's better right. off than we are. And, and even though, you know, currently there's plenty of news on the front page of every paper and magazine in the world that's scary and dark and ominous, it's also worth noting that on the whole, by most metrics, life, life is, is better than for it's most ever people. been. Yeah, that's right. People. And this is the greatest time in the world to have, to be alive. It doesn't mean it's true for every single person. Of course not. There's always because you can for take a, a Instagram of your dinner plate. You know, I mean, that's right. And sure, look at that incredible. Share it with two billion people yeah, instantly, exactly. right? <laughs> so this is an important idea, right? Because it's about the dissemination of ideas yeah. and information fast. Uh, earlier, I made some dark comments about mythology and you know how we're living in a time where people have disinformation. That's certainly true, but bear in mind, if you're at all interested in getting to the facts, they're available. You can get, the, you can, you can dig through or cut through all the hype and all the nonsense and all the noise and disinformation and get to the heart of the matter. And increasingly, it's possible to reach the actual people who are figuring this stuff out. That's part of our job on this show and part of our purpose is to spread better information, to spread awareness all over the world. Uh, the faster we all get on the same page about prioritization and ethics shaping the future, the faster we're gonna start to solve some of those dysfunctional or dy uh, dystopian scenarios. I, for one, yeah. am excited to sign up for that mission. Well, we're both optimists, and so I yeah. think that's going to come out in um, in the show. So um, over the next coming weeks, you're going to hear interviews from um, some of the top futurists in the world. Um, if if you have a favorite futurist or you have a topic, as Robert said, let us know what that is about. But certainly um, our job as hosts is to be positive and optimistic about the future and find those things that are really going to matter and make an impact on your future individually over the coming years and decades as well. So um, I guess that's it for our first show today, Robert. How do Super. you feel? I'm excited to do this with you, Brett. I've been looking forward to getting started, so I'm thrilled that we're going for it. This seems like a great new, great new approach. Absolutely. And uh, we will see you in, in, in the, the future. future.
Well, that's it for The Futurists this week. If you like the show, we sure hope you did. Please subscribe and share it with the people in your community. And don't forget to leave us a five-star review that really helps other people find the show. And you can ping us anytime on Instagram and Twitter at, at Futurist Podcast for the folks that you'd like to see on the show or the questions that you'd like us to ask. Thanks for joining. And as always, we'll see you in the future.